Our second scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Genesis in the third chapter. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to me to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is a dream that has made its way into the general psyche, certainly of this country. It's a, a dream that shows up often in popular culture, in sitcoms, and movies. It's a dream that is uh, profoundly mortifying, an embarrassing moment, typically happening at school. Do you know the dream I speak of? The dream of going to school without any clothes. Many of us have had this dream. That's a statistical reality. That's a very common dream in the world. And uh, I've had a variation of that dream these past six years after I was ordained. It always has the same background. I'm not at school. I'm at church, and I'm in the sanctuary, and it's always the same setup where Pastor John says, Ken, come up here to preach. And I'm sitting there. I do not have a sermon prepared. Sometimes I do not have an outfit prepared. And that is the moment of great fear. It's, a, it's an earnest moment of, of vulnerability, of feeling ill-prepared. And that's where often our vulnerability, certain our dreams might stem from, that we don't feel prepared, that we feel like we might fail, that others will see us as imperfect, and that we will be humiliated. When we're in our vocations, school, wherever we feel like there's a certain expectation, that dream might appear, that worry might appear. Now, none of those things might be true as it relates to the particular situation. You might be fully prepared. You might really be okay with the situation that you're moving to, but the worry still has an impact. And this is an ancient concern. We have just read this story from the third chapter of the book of Genesis, that we are a vulnerable people by nature, and we struggle to contend with our vulnerability. Do you all have a favorite Bible verse? A favorite Bible verse that you might refer to if you need some hope or encouragement, or maybe a Bible verse that you lift up as, as truly theologically important, something that bolsters your faith? I do, and I actually get that question quite a lot. What's your favorite Bible verse? And I'm not joking when I say, quickly, Genesis 2.25. Do you know it? Both man and woman were naked, and they felt no shame. That's not just like a youth ministry fun verse that we pulled out. I think that is so theologically significant. That there was a time, in fact, in our, God's intention for creation was to put us in a place of such security, such confidence, such trust, that even though we were vulnerable, we didn't feel that way. It's a hugely significant verse in my own theology. Yet here we are, very vulnerable creatures, insisting that we are less vulnerable than we are. We tend to put on a front, tempted to mask our feelings and our insecurities. Another way we could say this is we have a tendency to hide, just as Adam hid. But those masks will eventually fall. I'm a prime candidate for one who wants to hold up a mask of great confidence and supreme authority. I'm okay in most contexts and situations. I've been in most contexts and situations. But there's feelings present there. 
despite maybe my earnest to hide from them. Friends, I, um, I completed my doctorate this past week in Charlotte, North Carolina. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. I, um, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, three years went by very quick. Three years of this program, and, and it was really a joy. Um, and I presented on my final project on Thursday of this past week in Charlotte, and I'll officially graduate later this month. And as many of you know, my, my final project revolved around fatherhood. The title was Masculinity, Vulnerability, and Fatherhood, Pursuing Greater Engagement in the Faith Formation of Our Children. I picked a title that would just roll off the tongue. That's what I did in this. This was a joy of a project, truly. It gave me an opportunity to meet with many folks of this community, especially fathers, and to connect on a deeper level. And I got to research a project that I feel passionate about, fatherhood truly. And maybe the most formational element of my project was this deep dive into understanding vulnerability more. What I thought was going to be the cornerstone of my project, faith formation, that started to, started to blend in the background, and it was really vulnerability that came to the forefront of what this project would entail. It's a word that we come to with some mixed feelings. For a long time, I think we would say vulnerability is an exclusively bad thing. The connotation was, oh, we are susceptible to harm. Others might hurt us, and that would give us some concern. And I think now we've made a little more room in our modern-day vernacular for vulnerability. We can talk about vulnerability with some positive outcomes, yet we're still weary of the risks that come with vulnerability. And there are risks. When we're talking about vulnerability, we're talking about opening ourselves up to others, to potential hurt. I think the larger issue of the story of Adam and Eve was Adam's choosing to hide his vulnerability instead of trusting those around him with his vulnerability. Adam and Eve do not become vulnerable in the Garden of Eden. They are already vulnerable. Vulnerable to deceit, vulnerable to temptation, vulnerable to each other. They always had the tools to hurt one another, but it wasn't until they'd eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they judged that they could hurt each other. And friends, I, I don't think this is surprising, but there's nothing inherently wrong about being naked. We know this, right? In fact, most of us came into the world that way. There's a, a, a place for how we understand this moment and our own vulnerability. And as we see Adam, we fear the scrutiny of others. Do you remember when God is creating in the first two chapters of Genesis? He is creating and then he is proclaiming something. It is after everything God creates. God has judged. It is good. It is good. It is good. And then in this moment, the first moment where humanity is in the judgment chair, they judge each other's nudity as something to be ashamed of. And this is a misjudgment. We learn something about judgment in this text, about our uh, poor judgment. We see this story and we wonder, how, how do we move towards deeper trust? If only those two people could have shown us a different way. Instead, they, they don't hand each other their vulnerability. They hide from it. And what helped me in trying to think more about vulnerability is the research of Brene Brown. That's probably a name you're familiar with. She's a, she's a very popular author, and she's a leading expert in research as it relates to vulnerability. She offers this definition. Vulnerability isn't good or bad. It's not what we call a dark emotion, nor is it always a light, positive experience. Vulnerability is the core of all emotions and feelings. To feel is to be vulnerable. To believe vulnerability is weakness is to believe that feeling is weakness. To foreclose on our emotional life out of a fear that the cost will be too high is to walk away from the very thing that gives purpose and meaning to living. Here's the problem. We know we are vulnerable. 
Deep down, we can be hurt physically, emotionally, and relationally. Part of why we avoid being vulnerable is because in the moments we have been vulnerable, someone has hurt us. And so we're often unwilling to be more vulnerable. We shut that internal door closed. We mask, we numb, we avoid, we run from, we hide our honest, real feelings. We build this fortress around our feelings, but then we have this peculiar notion of, wow, the world feels so isolated. We feel such a disconnect between others, yet we are the ones building these fortresses around our own feelings. I highlight this as a considerable challenge. To wade into vulnerability is not easy. It was hard to put a hand on a shoulder for some of us. That is true. Just to break a physical barrier of proximity can challenge us. What do we do? How do we move into greater vulnerability? First, we learn from Adam. We say, hiding gets you nowhere. He did not gain anything from hiding. Instead, we drain the moat. We lower the drawbridge of these emotional castles we have built, and then we just accept that this will be uncomfortable. We are a people in this country who do not like being uncomfortable. Did you know this? Is this a surprise to you? No, I could ask you, if I, we sing a song that says we lift our hands up. We don't. We don't. We sing the song, but we don't do the song because we're uncomfortable. That is vulnerability. If I asked a room full of Presbyterians to raise their hands in worship, we'd have less Presbyterians in the room next week, I think. We struggle with vulnerability. In my presentation on Thursday, I asked my cohort, who is a father from the Bible that you would like for you, it to be your father? Which biblical father? You're like, that's, that's the dad I want. That's a hard question. I've learned this in the project. I was like, I don't know about the great biblical precedent there are for fathers. Who would be the father that I'd want in the Bible? Actually, what I found myself answering were those unnamed fathers in the Gospels. On, on, a, on a handful of occasions, there are these footnote fathers, they're not even given a name, who approach Jesus and they beg at his feet to heal their sick child. They ignore the societal customs. They don't care about reputation. In the moment of great despair, they find themselves vulnerable and they lean into it and they move towards Jesus faithfully. I think those are the dads that I would choose There are some, those are some vulnerable people, and they might have been pushed to vulnerability. It might have been because of their circumstances that they found themselves willing to be more vulnerable. For us, for this church, for PCPC, and really all who call themselves children of God, I would have us choose vulnerability. Not be forced into it, but truly choose it because it's the better way to more meaningful relationships regardless of our circumstance. I know without a shadow of a doubt that every single person in this room is contending with real difficult things. I've never met anyone who said, yeah, life is easy. We have all of the stuff that we bring into this room and we try to hold it often by ourselves. And I I hope we will choose vulnerability in moving towards each other and sharing these things, opening up those pathways that we might find more meaningful relationship, but also find true, authentic help. We talk about how this is a challenge, and without a willingness, we won't move towards vulnerability. Yet if we look at Jesus, we see someone who moves towards vulnerability, and we would say that humility is the older brother of vulnerability, something that Jesus models time and again. Jesus who washes the disciples' feet, Jesus who cries publicly for the loss of his friend, Jesus who welcomes children and behaved in such a way that he was persecuted. He was vulnerable to death, vulnerable to death on a cross. I'm not asking anybody in this room to take down all their walls and to start sharing your deepest, darkest fears and failures with one another. But I am asking everybody in this room to take a step towards greater vulnerability. For some of us, that's simply acknowledging the fact that we are feeling people, that we can't actually say, well, I don't really feel much, or I'm not very sensitive. No, we are all sensitive, feeling people, though we might try to 
trick ourselves. That's a crucial step, just identifying the fact that it's not just our loud outward emotions that make us feeling people. If you're not one who gets upset and cries, that's fine. But if you're one who is disappointed or angry or moves towards criticism, you've got feelings, friend. It's all of us. We are a feelings people. And so acknowledging it, yeah, that's a good step for many of us. For others, we need to let people in on some of the unique challenges of our lives and to receive the help from others and walk alongside each other better. For others, we need to get things off our chest, the thing that has been the problem, whether it's with faith or with family, the challenge that we have no, we've just not been able to overcome, maybe that's the thing we need to lift up. For others, we need to just share a little bit more about ourselves, even if no one has asked, and just share how we've been feeling. Once we start to slowly wade into greater vulnerability, we will gain some confidence that those who love us will continue to love us when we have become more vulnerable, that those around us can actually handle our feelings, and that it indeed feels good to feel. Here's the purpose. Here's why we do this. When we do this, when we wade into greater vulnerability, we build greater empathy for each other. We don't come into the room as strangers but we see each other as family. We will be tempted to hide less, meaning bringing more into the light that needs to be brought into the light, and we will learn to trust each other more, which means we'll learn to love better. These are not my ideas. This comes from Scripture, how God intends us to live. And it comes down to choice. What will we choose? Within our relationships, with your own personal decisions, will you move towards more vulnerability? In the midst of our feelings, especially those things that make us feel small or embarrassed or weak or insignificant, will we, learn to, will we lean towards each other and will we lean towards God? Here's our first chance. We have an opportunity just today uh, is to come to this table and to see who we walk alongside as we move towards the table and who receives us here. Remember, this is not PCPC's table, but this is the table of the church of Jesus Christ, and it is Jesus himself, God himself, that invites us to this table. So I'll end here. We can sow a variety of leaves around our vulnerability, but we know that we cannot fool God. It is as we truly are in this moment that God chooses to love us.